How many people want to live the good life? Good life. I want to live the good life. And that good life is the spirit-led life. So today I'm going to take you on a journey. You know how I do. I got ADD and stuff. And, uh, you know, if you try and keep up with me in the scriptures, I don't think you're going to be able to because I'm going to jump around a little bit. But we're going to start in John chapter 10. And then I'm going to hop around a little bit. So when I, when I leave John chapter 10, if you want, just stay in John chapter 10 because I don't want you to miss what I'm going to read because by the time you flip there, I'm already out there to another place. So, and I really want you guys to listen today to this. Um, because if you're a Christian or not a Christian, it doesn't matter what you believe in. You want the good life. And the good life is what God came to give us. The scripture says that he's come to give life, but the enemy, Satan, has come to steal, to steal, kill, and destroy. So we're going we're gonna to go on this little journey, but... Um, you know, this is like part two to chapter, so chapter nine is where the story starts. It's this man that's blind from birth, and Jesus is up at Jerusalem for one of the big festivals, and he's walking with his disciples. He sees this guy that's blind, and they said, hey, is this guy blind because of, of sin? Because they used to believe that if you were born with blind or something like that, it's because you were a sinner, but it wasn't. And Jesus said, no, this guy was just born blind so that God could reveal his power to him. So the story goes, Jesus walks up, spits on, on the mud, spits on the ground, makes mud, throws it on the guy's eyes. His disciples are probably like, Jesus, what's up? Spitting on mud and put it on the guy's face? Like, are you kidding me right now? It's a little crazy, right? So what Jesus does is puts it on and he goes, hey, now go to the pool of Siloam and wash your eyes and you can see. So Jesus activated his faith. The guy took off. He went there. All of a sudden, he washed his eyes. He could see. And then people were there like, this is the blind dude. He could see. They're like, who healed you? He's like, I can't see. This is the first time I'm seeing. I'm like tripping out right now. Like, I don't know who healed me. Some guy put mud on my, my face, you know, and spit. And they, so they took him to the Pharisees and the Sadducees because Jesus is a rebel, right? What did he do? He healed on the Sabbath. They broke the traditions of the temple. So they take him to the Pharisees and they're like, who healed you? He's like, dude, I don't know. Some dude named Jesus or something. I don't know. Well, where is he? He's like, I don't know, man. I can barely, I just, I can see, like, this is crazy. Like, so anyway, it goes on. They start interrogating him. And, well, were you, were you born blind? Yeah, I was born blind. All I know is I could see now. So they bring in his parents because they couldn't believe that this guy was healed on the Sabbath. So they bring his parents in and they're like, is this your son? Yeah. Is he born blind? Yeah. Well, who healed him? He already told them it was Jesus. So they're like, they didn't want to get kicked out of the temple because anyone that would talk about Jesus would get kicked out of the temple, right? So they're like, he's a grown man. You talk to him. They're like, we're trying to keep our, you know, our membership to the church. You talk to him. So he says, I told you, man, it was this guy, Jesus. All I know is, is I was blind and now I can see. And they're like, well, Jesus, he, he's a man. He's a total sinner. He, how could he heal him? He's like, look at you guys. I told you time after time, what do you guys want to be his disciples? Like just clowns on those guys, right? They're like, what? Get out of here. You're out of here. And they kicked him out of the temple. So they basically booted him from the religious system. He's out in the streets now shunned by the religious system, but he's been touched by Jesus, which is the key. So now continuing in, in John chapter 9, verse 35, I'm going to start reading from there. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and he asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man, which is the messianic title for the Son of God, the Messiah? So now what I like is after this guy got kicked out by the religious leaders, shunned from the church, Jesus heard what happened and he went on a mission to go find him. Because Jesus loves his, his sheep, right? He loves his people. So he says, hey, do you believe? And the man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe. And Jesus says, you've seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. This must have been an awe moment, just like, what the heck? I'm standing in front of the Messiah. The dude that spit on the ground and put mud on my eyes just healed me. This is the Son of God that I'm looking at. So he's probably in awe, obviously. Verse 38, it says this. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. And this is the key to our relationship, calling Jesus Christ Lord. Not only calling him Lord, but making him Lord. That means number one in our life, believing that he died on the cross and he raised on the third day. And that's where the forgiveness of sins comes from. And then we worship him. How do we worship him? In the way we live, obeying the commandments. You know, and it's going to talk about the law later on in this study, but the law... You know, we don't have to worry about thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not covet. If we have the Holy Ghost in our lives, if we're living that spirit-led life, we automatically obey the law. We don't have to be like, oh, did I break the law? It's like it just happens because it's a supernatural work from the Holy Ghost. So here he goes, verse 39. It says, then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some of the Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, 
Are you saying that we're blind? Now understand, this is an action scene here. Jesus is there, and these religious leaders and other people around him, and now Jesus is like, he's calling out these religious leaders. He's going he's gonna to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys right now. They catch wind, and they're like, what, hey, are you calling us blinds? These guys, you know, they, want, they liked everyone to, to bow down to them and worship, not worship them, but like look highly of them. They wanted like the respect and to go through the city and pray out loud and, oh, we're fasting. We, you know, so everyone thinks they're all spirit, you know, holy rollers. But Jesus is here. He's telling them that they're straight blind, right? So verse 40, uh, they, some of the Pharisees were standing there nearby and heard him. And they asked, are you saying that we're blind? And Jesus probably looked at him just from the side. He was like, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus said. But because you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Or in the King James Version, he said, you wouldn't have sin if you couldn't see. But you say you see, so you still have sin. You blind guides. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 10, the story continues. Verily, 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 in your King James Version or New King James Versions, but in my New Living Translation, it basically breaks down what verily, verily, verily means. I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. So here's Jesus giving an illustration to these guys. You know, he speaks in parables sometimes. The sheepfold represents the church. The sheep represents the people. So we'll just look at this place as a sheepfold for now. And he's talking about the gate. Later on, Jesus is going to say that he is the gate, the gateway to salvation, the gateway to God. And then we have the thieves and the robbers. So what he's saying is whoever just jumps over the, the, the sheepfold, which the sheepfold was the thing that would hold the sheep at night, the you know, the uh, shepherds would come in, numerous shepherds with their different flocks, and put them all in together in the sheepfold. It would be in a cave, and then the shepherd would stay at the gate of the, the end of the cave to protect them from any animals coming in or any robbers. Or it would be made up of branches, and it would, it would corral them all in, and then um, that would be the place where they would stay. So basically, he's saying that the sheep are in the sheepfold, and the, Jesus is the gate to salvation, and these robbers... And these thieves, he's going to refer to the religious leaders. Because we know the story when Jesus started his public ministry, the first thing he did is he, he went in after leaving Satan, after being tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, he went to the city of Jerusalem and he walked into the temple and he saw that the religious leaders were ripping off God's people. He was taxing them. They were making it hard and difficult for them to come in to worship God. And what did Jesus do? You know the story, one of my favorites? He made a whip. And he started whipping them all out. He whipped all the animals. He whipped all the people out. Started kicking over the tables and shaking out the money. And it didn't say, like Chuck Smith says, it didn't say that he whipped anyone, but it doesn't say he didn't. You know what I'm saying? It got rowdy up in there, right? So, it, and why? Because Jesus is calling these guys thieves and robbers. Jesus had a righteous anger. He was not too stoked on these guys. So now he's calling them blind guides. And now we're moving on. It goes on to say this. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. So now here's the other illustration of what would happen back then. In the morning when they would wake up and they would take the sheep back out, the shepherd would roll up to the sheep. And remember, there's numerous sheep, different flocks of sheep. And then they would walk up. And because they would know his voice, the shepherd would walk up and call him. And I don't know what they would call him. I'm just going to say the way I call my friends. I'd be like, Orale, vamos, let's go, let's go, you know. And they would know that, that call. They would know that call. They would know his voice. And then they would uh, follow him out there. Verse, verse 4, after he, the shepherd, has gathered his own flock, he, will, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. And what a good illustration this is of us. He calls us. We accept him as our Lord and our Savior. Then we follow him, and he leads us. And that's a great illustration of our life is that we know his voice. So he's leading us through life. We have the Holy Spirit so we can hear his voice. And he leads us through our life to live into that good life is basically what we're going to get to a little bit later. Verse 5, they won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. And my question to you is, you may call yourself a Christian, but do you know his voice? Or are you just going through the motions? Do you just call yourself a Christian? And this is like, I'm not pointing anyone out. I'm just saying it in general. Do we call ourselves Christians because we come to church every Sunday? We're like, yes, I'm a Christian. I did it. Second service, Dunskis, every Sunday. <laughs> oh, I go to the men's study. I do that because my wife makes me go, I'm a Christian. Yes. Or, you know, oh, I, I don't go to church, but I give to the church. I give, you know, millions of dollars. So I'm, a, I'm definitely a Christian. No. Do you hear his voice? 
Because there's a relationship going on right here. There's the sheep and the shepherd, and they know his voice. He calls them, and they go. And that's the, that's, that's the way our life should look like. Verse 6, those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. Verily, 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 I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. He's just leveling it. I am the gate for the sheep. Jesus is saying, we know that the verse says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father God but by me. I am the way to eternal life. I am the truth. You know, what's his name? Uh, the guy that whipped Jesus or the guy that sentenced him. I can't think of his name. Uh, Pilate. Pilate said, what is truth? He says, I am the truth, Jesus says. So he is the truth. And then he goes on to say again, I am the gate, the gateway to salvation, the gateway to eternal life, the gate to God the Father for the sheep. Who are the sheep? For people. We are the sheep. All who have come before me were thieves and robbers. He says it again. All the false prophets and all the Pharisees and Sadducees that became corrupt were thieves and robbers because they were stealing from God's people. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Jesus said it again. I am the gate to salvation. And whoever comes in through me that believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. I underline that. You will be saved. Who, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, it says in, in Romans 10, 13. Not whosoever goes to church every day, whosoever has never sinned, everyone has sinned, but whosoever is a pretty good person. No, every drug addict, every murderer, every baller, every president, whoever, anybody, just common folks, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Because as Jesus says in verse 9, he says, yes, I am the gate. I want to flip over here really quick. And here's the journey starts in Matthew 7, 13. Jesus says this. Jesus says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. So now first we just read that Jesus says, I am the gate to salvation. Now what is he saying? Now he's saying he, uh, no one can uh, enter. You can't enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. So now he's saying this gate is narrow. And there's people that say, oh, you Christians, you're so narrow minded. Jesus, this and this. Yes, I'm extremely narrow minded. You know why? Because Jesus says that the road to eternal life, to, to the kingdom of God is very narrow. And the only way you get there is through Jesus. It's the only way. So it's extremely narrow. It's Jesus. The highway to hell is broad and its gates are wide and, and for many choose that way. So now he's saying the highway to hell is wide and many will find that way. Well, if you want to know how to go to hell, anyone here, if anyone's wondering, um, pretty much do whatever you want. There's a million different ways you could go to hell. Do whatever you want. And the only thing you don't have to do is you don't have to believe in Jesus, that he is the son of God. If you don't believe in Jesus and you believe in any other religion or just do, be an atheist or do whatever you want to do, that's the wide road. Many ways go to hell. And it says many people find that way. Then Jesus goes on to say, but the gateway to life, which life is eternal life to heaven, is very narrow. Now he says it's very narrow. Before he says it's narrow. Now he says it's very narrow. And the roads are difficult. Come on, Jesus, what's going on here, man? You're making it tough for us, right? Well, why is it so difficult? Why is it so very narrow? And he says that only few ever find it. Now I'm going to flip over to Matthew 16, 24, and read what he says here. He says, this is why it's narrow. Jesus said to his disciples, which we are his disciples, if any of you want to follow me, you've got to turn from your selfish ways and pick up your cross and follow me. Take note of that verse. I'm going to come back to that and explain what that is. If any of you guys want to be my disciples, you've got to turn from your selfish ways, pick up your cross, and follow me. Those selfish ways are your body appetites. Verse 25, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. So what is Jesus is saying? He's saying you've got to lose your life. You've got to put him first. Seek you first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added you got to put him in front of your job. Put him in front of your family. Seek ye first. But when you put him first, he gives it all back. And I'm not saying turn your back on your family or your job. No, no. Go, keep going to work. <laughs> Do that. 
take care of your family, take your kids to school and do all that stuff. But seek God's will first, like read and pray and get plugged into the source. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Don't put yourself first, put him first, but then he gives it all back. I've learned that personally. Verse 26, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and you lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? And that's the thing that we gotta do inventory in our life is like, what are we losing our souls for? Right now, if you died, would you go to hell? And if you were gonna go to hell, what would it be for? Is it like your porn addiction? Is it like, because you can't get on, off like Vicodins? Or is it like your anger problem that you're letting rage and anger? Paul says, don't let anger even get a foothold. Satan will get a foothold through that stuff. Unforgiveness? What are these things that are in your life getting wasted, sleeping around, sleeping with some guy's wife, sleeping with some girl's husband? Um, whatever it is, homosexuality, I mean, anything. What the heck are you giving your soul up for? Is there any, Jesus says, is there anything worth more than your soul? To answer that question, no. There's nothing, because heaven and hell is real. So now Jesus goes on to say this. So he said, I, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Then he goes on to say this. They will come and they will go freely and they will find good pastures. When I read that, I was like, what is Jesus talking about some pastures right now? What is he talking about right here? Well, he's saying they could come in to me. They could come to me. What do they do? You come to Jesus. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and do whatever you want with my life. You put him first. So you come, you accept him, you believe that he died on the cross and he raised on the third day. Then whoever the son, Jesus Christ sets free is free indeed, right? How many people have been set free? Throw your hands up. How many people? Well, that's almost 90% of this place, maybe more. Okay, proof right there. Whoever the son sets free, come to Jesus, give your life to him. Then the son sets you free and then you go into good pastures. So I started, I was sitting there at my desk thinking about what does this good pastures look like? What is Jesus? What are you talking about these good pastures right now, right? So this is what I wrote down. It says this, I wrote, uh, he means good quality life. It's the good life. Like I was talking to this girl that helps us with the triplets because you know, they turn a little terrace that night, you know, it gets crazy, <laughs> you know, for the first part, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna get rid of that, but uh, we have them right now. And she's a believer, she had quads, she had quads. She's all triplets, whatever. <laughs> She's all, give me all three of these. No, just joking. She had quads. She's crazy. But uh, anyway, long story short, we were talking about the good life and uh, about this message. And she says, you know what? She says, you know, she was talking about, you know, when, you, when you're walking with God, you have this good life because it's a spirit-led life. And I thought to myself, I said, yeah, I mean, you know, there could be people that can go, well, I don't believe in your God. I'm going to do my own thing. And they go, you know, what, what, if, they go, what if you're wrong, Ryan? Well, if I'm wrong at the end of the day, so, so say if I'm wrong and there's no God, which I know 100% there is, I die and poof, you know, I turn into a tree or whatever you want to believe, or you just go non-existence or whatever it be, and that's that, it's done, or reincarnated, I don't know what people believe, but anyway, that's not true. But if I'm right and God is real, then I escape hell, I enter heaven, and even if it wasn't all real, at the end of the day, I die and I had a good quality of life. Because when you read about the Bible, do not lie, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet, don't be jealous, don't sleep with your, your friend's wife. I mean, come on, those are all good things, right? That's a good quality of life. I don't want to do that stuff. And when you're not living by the Spirit, these things creep into your life. So at the end of the day, you're going to have a good quality of life if you live the Christian walk. But if you follow Jesus, the dope thing is he reveals himself. He plants his Holy Spirit in you. And that's how you know it's real. But you have to invite him into your life. And then you will have an encounter with the living God. And you'll know that it's real. Religion is like going through these acts. I go to church, but there's no Holy Spirit. So they're like, I hope I get to heaven. Cross my fingers. <laughs> Dude, I'm not about to cross the fingers. I need a guarantee. And Jesus is like, that's why I give you my spirit. Boom, I implant it in you and your life starts transforming and you know that God's Holy Spirit is in you. So that's what that good life is. What does it look like? Number one, he forgives you. People cannot deal with their past, right? A lot of you guys here cannot deal with your past. You get those little flashbacks in your hard drive, right? And Satan brings up a little video. Remember this, remember this, remember this. And then you feel condemned your whole life. Who condemns? Satan's the condemner. Jesus is the forgiver. 
Jesus died on the cross. He was murdered on the cross. And he raised on the third day. And this is why there's a forgiveness of sins. And through the blood that was shed on the cross, we are washed white as snow. And then he sends his, his Holy Spirit, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's that dynamite power, that TNT power. Stick a stick of dynamite in this building. This thing's ghosts, right? Jesus says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Acts 1.8. And that power that they use is dunamis. It's dynamite power. He will baptize you. He will reveal himself. He will forgive you. Then he will lead you in your life. He will guide you. He will protect you. He will strengthen you. He will speak to you. He will teach you. He will use your life. And we are all his masterpiece designed for his eternal purpose. How do we find out our eternal purpose? It's in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have to be plugged in. My dad used this illustration with me. You know my dad. Hey, Brian, listen, I was going to tell you this story. <laughs> so he's like, he was talking about being plugged into the source. And he's like, hey, how, do you get, how, does, your phone, how does your phone get charged? I said, Dad, you got to plug it into the wall. Duh. I know. He's like, exactly. He's like, and you have to be plugged in to God to be charged or else you're going to be empty. And then I started thinking with my crazy mind, well, I remember that time I was going to go to a concert. I need to plug my phone in. And I plugged it in overnight. And I'm like, oh, no, I was going to a plane. There's, well, another time I was going on a plane, right, actually recently. And I plugged it in. And guess what? It was plugged in all night. And I woke up and it had the red sign with the 10% on the iPhone. I was like, dang. I was plugged in, but I wasn't getting the juice. I wasn't like plugged in. I wasn't connected. And in the same way, coming to church and not reading the Bible or not praying, you're plugged in, but you're not connected. You're not getting the source. You're not getting charged. That is the key to a relationship with God. And the Bible is the DNA of Jesus Christ. And also, you know, another little Bible-ism I heard a long time ago is Bible means basic instructions before leaving the earth. Basic instructions before leaving the earth. You need those. Because when you leave, you want to go up, not down. Very important. And where you spend eternity is like buying a house. It's all about location, location, location. <laughs> True that. All right. Here we go. Here's some cool verses I got for you guys, what, what the good life looks like. Matthew 11, 28, 30. Then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest for your soul. Does that not look like the good life? All you that are carrying burdens right now and weary, stressed out. Jesus said, come to me. I'm going to give you rest for your soul. That's that good life. Then he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light that I give. He says, I will give you rest for your soul now. That is the good life. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So you're saying, Ryan, I could draw near to the creator of the universe. Like in Genesis, when it says God created the, the heavens and the earth, when Jesus was there, because in the beginning, in Genesis 1, it says Elohim for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, let there be light, there was light. Yes, you could draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Why? Because you have his Holy Spirit inside you. He's already with you, but he'll speak to you and he'll baptize you. Proverbs 69 says, we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Dude, I love this one because how many times us as Christians that love Jesus, we make plans and they, they're not good sometimes. And we end up like Jesus has a straight path for us, this difficult path, we're straight. And then we get on this little detour. And we're like, dang it, I made the wrong decision. I'm on this detour. But that's when God throws out his grace card with this verse and by his Holy Spirit pushes us right back on the right track, right? I don't know about you guys, but that's, that's a lifesaver for me. I'm like, God, I'm, that other Proverbs, I'm too stupid to be human. You know that one? Come on. How, that's, I say that prayer a lot, believe me. I'm too stupid to be human, Lord. Help me, lead me. Your Bible says it. Do it. Push me into the right situations because I make bad decisions. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Well, Jesus says the road to eternal life is narrow and few find it, and it's very difficult, and it's very narrow, he said. Remember that? Well, guess what? You need a lamp, and the word of God is a lamp that guides our feet on our path. The word of God, like I just said, he will lead you. Ephesians 2, 10 for we are God's masterpiece, and he has created us anew, brand new, in Jesus Christ, so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. When Jesus was posted up at the beginning, outside of time, because he's outside of time, 
He had plans for us long ago. We are masterpiece. He designed us all with a purpose. And the way we can do it is we have to be born again anew in Jesus Christ. And then we can live out what he planned for us long ago. It's all there for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans of good and not for disaster, to give you the future and the hope. This is a fact. This is the Lord saying this. I'm going to read it again. Jeremiah 29, 11. Some of you need to hear this right now. For I know the plans I have for you. God has plans for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. This is my life 100%, you guys. This is a fact. Christians used to always quote this to me when I first got saved. And I was like, what is that, the go-to verse? Everyone like quotes that verse. <laughs> Well, you know what? Nine years later, here I am. That verse is epic, and that is so true, 100%. But sometimes when you're in those storms and you're coming out of that past life, it seems sketchy. But you know what? God is working all things together for good for those that love him according to his purpose. Sometimes we go through hardships, and it's because God is taking us on that journey because he's strengthening our faith. You know the triplet story, the living the impossible? He's trying to show you how to live the impossible. But he's going to take you through the fire. And like when gold goes through the fire, it has these black pieces on it. And it goes through the fire and it purifies it. It makes this amazing piece of gold. And going through hardships in our life, God sometimes uses that to purify us. So to draw near to him, so we will draw near to him. So we will seek his will. And he can shape us and mold us like the potter in Jeremiah. Talks about the shape, the molder, the potter breaking them down and remolding them. And he's going to keep breaking you down and remolding you until he gets it right. And then he's going to fill you with torrents of the living water. When Jesus says, all you that are thirsty may come and drink. All of you guys that are thirsty for relationship with God, all you guys that are empty with your job, your money, your success, and all these things, you're trying to fill that empty void. You're, if you're thirsty for that, ask Jesus, and he says, I will send torrents of living water. When you look up, when you, you know, my Bible says living water, right? When I think of living water, I'm like, oh, that's cute. Little, little stream, living water, it's moving, big deal, right? Well, when you look up the original language, it uses torrents of living water. Now I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. So when you start looking up the torrents of living water, the torrents of living water, when you look it up in the, in the dictionary, torrents is a raging, rushing river of violent force. Put, when, you, when you see a torrents of like Niagara Falls, rushing river, or you see like a, a flood, or like, you know, uh, a tsunami or whatever, this raging rivers, these torrents, come through and rip out people, houses, cars. It removes everything in its way. Am I not correct? Torrents of living water is what Jesus is saying. He's saying anyone that is thirsty may come and drink, and I will give you torrents of living water. And what he's talking about is that torrents of, of holiness coming down from the throne of God and coming through our body and pushing out everything that is unholy in our life. So God's going to make you a vessel. He's going to shape and mold you into this masterpiece. And then you ask him and you will receive and he will send that violent force of holiness to come baptize you and push out all these things that you're trying to get rid of in your life. These body appetites. Violent force of holiness. That's what I'm talking about. Not this little living water stuff. Nope. Give me torrents, Lord. That's what I'm talking about. So Jeremiah 17, 8 says, they are like trees planted along the riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by the long months or drought. The leaves stay green and they will never stop producing fruit. Jesus is using the illustration as us as Christians that we are like trees. My old life, you guys, you guys know my old life, and if you don't, you, I don't got time right now, but it was crazy. Let's just say I was a pirate, right? So. From the outside, my friends looked at me. I got the killer job. I'm managing a professional skateboard team for 10 years, working in the music industry for even longer, making money, getting paid, traveling the world nine months, just, just doing, doing the thing, right? From the outside, everyone's like, dude, you got the life. You got the Harleys. You got the company car, flying business class. Boom, they're giving you cash to do whatever you want. Living the dream, right? I was a tree that looked good, but I wasn't producing fruit. But then when I gave my life to God, I basically started producing fruit. He's saying that our feet will grow, our roots will grow deep into the water, which is the living water, which is God's holiness. And then out of our lives, we will produce fruit. I got a lemon tree at my house right now, and a, and a uh, what, lemon and a lime tree. They look good, but they don't produce fruit. 
I'm about to get an axe and chop it down like Jesus and throw it into the fire because these things look good, but they aren't producing fruit. And this is what they're talking about right now, a tree that produces good fruit. You can't just look good on the outside. You got to produce fruit. And the fruits are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And then in closing for this little part, it says this, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen whose hearts are fully committed to him. That is my life verse. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen whose hearts are fully committed. Not God's eyes are looking through the whole earth for perfect Christians, for people that don't sin, for, for people that go to church every night of the week. God is looking for you no matter what life you're in. If you're, it doesn't matter. The eyes of the Lord are looking to the earth for whoever's hearts that are fully committed in any state of life that you're in, in any state of the relationship with Jesus Christ you are. He's looking to strengthen you. So that's what that looks like. This is the good life. Going on, so it says this. They will come and they will go freely and they will find good pastures. So now you know what that verse means. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. So he's saying Satan's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy your life. But Jesus says, my life is to give. He wants to steal. I want to give you a rich and satisfying life. You come to me, you will be set free, and you will go into good pastures, and you will have a good life, a rich and satisfying life. You go mess with Satan, and he's going to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm going to read what that looks like in Galatians 5. It looks like this. Galatians 5, 16 says, So let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Because Satan... He, dude, he goes after your body appetites, sinful nature. He's, he's all about the flesh. God's all about the spirit. So this is the war, what it looks like that me and you go through right here. The sinful nature, uh, nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what your spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what your sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting against each other. So you are not free to carry out your own good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, you are not under obligation of the law of Moses, which that's that law is telling you about. You just automatically obey it when you have the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts, anger, selfish ambition, dissension, which is conflict, division, envying, getting wasted, being a drunk, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, he says, as I have, anyone, anyone living this sort of lives will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So if we're here, we call ourselves Christian, and our life looks like this, Paul says this, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That is heavy. So if you're here and you're out sleeping with your girlfriend and you're going to first base, second base, third base is a given, obviously, any of the bases, you're hitting any of the bases, um, or you're, you're, you're a grown man and you're cheating on your wife or, or any of these things and you're out being a drunk or, you know, and you're having this conflict and you're just living it like a man of the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what it's saying. And what's crazy is, do you know how many people are actually having sex with each other in the church that aren't married? First base, second base, third base, that is not holy. I feel like I'm eating crazy pills when I talk to people and they go, well, I'm dating this girl, she's not a Christian. And I'm like, <laughs> but you know what it is? People don't read the Bible. <laughs> the root of it is people don't have a relationship with God. They don't hear his voice. He's the good shepherd. He'll tell you. I'm not there just to pick on that, but that's the given because a lot of people don't do drugs and all that stuff, you know, but people, you know, they want to hook up. You got to wait for your husband. You got to wait for your wife. All things work together for good for those that love Christ. He's got you. You just got to submit your ways. Seek you first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Now going on, it says this. But the Holy Spirit produces these kinds of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ have nailed their passion and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them. Remember that verse, deny yourself, 
pick up your cross and follow me. Remember what Jesus was saying? Well, this is the breakdown of it. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed their passions and desires of their flesh, of their simple natures, to his cross and crucified them. Since we are living by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Spirit leading us in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. So that is the difference between the flesh and the Spirit. Now going on, it says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. I'm giving my life to die for the sins of the world. A hired hand will run when he sees the wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks him and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. How many people are in the church trying to use it as a platform to make money? You heard about that pastor that wanted a $65 million jet so he can go to Africa and feed the poor? Like, what? What a clown, you know? And people that use God's people, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to get rich off of them. That is not biblical. These are wolves in sheep clothing. Verse 14, I, and he got the, the jet, by the way. Um, uh, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. God knows you. Do you know God? Because that's what he says. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep, for the people. I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and they will be one flock with one shepherd. So he's speaking in the future. We're his sheep. We weren't there with him then, but we are sheep, one shepherd, one flock. We're in there together. Verse 17, the father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it up again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it back up for this is what the Father commanded me. The Father told him to go and die for the sins of the world that we will all be saved. And he says, hey, there's no Joseph Smith, there's no Buddha, there's no Hindu gods, you know, Mary. No one, no one has died, gave their life, and raised from the third day. But Jesus has, and he says, I do it for the people because this is what the Father commanded. Verse 19. When he, said these things, the pe when he said these things to the people, they were again divided in their opinions about him. Some said he's demon possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to a man like this? And others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind? No, they can't. Only God can do that. And Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ has a plan for you. You are a masterpiece. He created you with an eternal purpose. And some of you guys don't, you may think you know him, but you don't because you don't hear his voice. Today is the day that the Lord has made. You might be in a crossroads, but today you need to commit your life to God. Get serious. Find out the plan. It's a plan for futures, and it's a plan for hope. If you are weary, come to God. If you carry heavy burdens, come to God. If you have a relationship with God, ask him for torrents of living water so you can have that dynamite power that could rip out these things that are unholy in your life. Recently, I've been, not recently, but for years, I, I, like, I still like watching funny videos. If you follow me on Instagram, I post funny videos. Okay? The girl with the gym, the gym one. Yeah, you see that one? Okay. Hilarious. Watch it. So I've been going to these blogs and I'm watching these videos and they have like skate videos and surf videos and, you know, just funny and rad stuff. But they, they have these advertisements for these girls and, uh, you know, they're in bikinis. I surf and I, so I'm at the beach and I see girls in bikinis all the time. That's like whatever. But there's something different when you have a girl in a bikini and she's like doing like, you know, oh, I don't know what you girls do, how you pose, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> when they position their body in a certain way, and they take a picture and they have that face. Well, that does something to me. That does something to men, men, right? And girls, if you see guys in, you know, maybe in their bikinis, I don't know. <laughs> you know, Calvin Klein guys, you know, whatever. Whatever it is. But what was going on is I'm, I'm like, okay, the Holy Spirit's like, okay, Ryan, you shouldn't be here anymore. You know what I mean? Like, this is like, 
No. So I go, okay, God, torrents of living water. You spoke to me, and literally I stopped going to those ones. I had to unfollow a couple other ones because randomly you get some random stuff. So I'm still watching funny videos. The, the saga goes on. But I'm not going to those websites where they have these girls modeling clothes and stuff that pop up every once in a while. And since that happened, I can't tell you, I feel like the Holy Spirit is working even harder in my life now. Just by surrendering it, saying, God, I can go there and it's all good. I'm going to make it to heaven. But you know what, God? I want you. I want torrents of living water. And I want to be as close as I can to your heart because I want to be used. I'm that masterpiece. I want to find out that eternal purpose why you created me. So therefore, I want to slowly start removing things as God reveals things in my life. Certain music, certain things. But God has that plan for you too. I'm just being transparent with my, my bunk life, you know? You guys probably got the good life, you know? And God, God wants to increase it for you.